And welcome to Pick 6 Movies, the podcast where each season we pick six movies based on a theme, then give you some behind-the-scenes history of how the movie got made, and then we review the film from start to finish to see if it's any good. And those sounds of chainsaws echoing in the night followed by creepy organ music means just one thing in this neck of the hillbilly-infested woods. That's right, we're smack dab in the middle of a season that's all about horror movies. Specifically, this is season 22 with the theme Deja Ew, where we're taking on a half dozen horror movie remakes based on famous franchises born out of the last two decades of the 20th century. Who is this we of which I speak? Well, it's none other than my lifelong pal, Mr. Bo Ransdell, who is smarter, funnier, and more polite than I will ever be. And who am I? Well, I'm none other than Chad Cooper, the second half of the hosting duo that makes up Pick 6 Movies. This is episode three of our season where we're examining the remake of the Toby Hooper horror classic, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Now, I asked our intern Dave and our other intern Garrett, who goes by the name Chainsaw when he's at (laughs) horror movie conventions, to share their thoughts on the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And here's what they had to say. Oh, I gotta tell you, I love this film. It had passion and a plucky spirit, and the the characters had integrity. Like when Leatherface went on that strict diet of human flesh, he had to cut out chicken and fish completely. Dave, I agree with you. I'll go a step further. Sure, Leatherface, he wore a mask made out of human skin and he hung people on meat hooks. But hey, we've all got quirks. I've got them. You've got them, Dave. That's what makes this character so, so compelling. Thumbs up for me. Same here. To sum it up, I'm Chainsaw, I'm Dave, we'll see you at the movies. <laughs> when I asked them to share their thoughts on the remake, they told me that that was my job and they're not getting paid enough to do that. And let's be honest, they're interns and they're not getting paid at all. So let's not waste any more time and let's get Bo in here to tell us all about how the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre got made and the ill-conceived logic that led to this lackluster remake. Bo, get in here and give us a little holiday cheer. It was holiday season in 1972 when a young filmmaker named Toby Hooper found himself in a Montgomery Ward department store. The place was crowded with Christmas shoppers, and all Hooper wanted to do was get out. As he weighed the best means of escape, his eyes fell on a display. Chainsaws stacked up for purchase. He thought to himself, grabbing one of those bad boys, firing it up so that the din of shoppers' voices were suddenly silenced by the whir of the engine, now that would be a good way to get out. Hooper escaped the store by less dramatic means, but the notion of the kind of havoc you could wreak with a chainsaw stuck with him, and a litany of story ideas peppered his brain. He was no stranger to the idea of sudden violence. Toby Hooper was on the campus of the University of Texas in Austin in August of 1966 when Charles Whitman climbed a bell tower and started shooting. Over the course of 96 minutes, Whitman would kill 14 people and wound 31 more. One of those victims was a cop who warned Hooper to get inside and hide that there was a sniper on the bell tower. While Hooper watched, the policeman was hit by a bullet and fell to the ground in front of him. In 1969, Toby Hooper directed his first feature called Eggshells, an American Freak Hallucination. It was the story of a bunch of hippies who were terrorized by, and I quote, a crypto-embryonic hyper-electric presence. It was Hooper reflecting on the idealism of the 1960s, brought low by violence and the assassinations of Robert and John Kennedy, of Martin Luther King Jr., all of them radicals associated with the peace movement struck down by a bullet, just the way the policeman warning Hooper of danger had been struck down. The hippie movement was the dream, Hooper thought. The bullets raining down from a bell tower, that was the reality. By the time Hooper would shoot the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, there were the additional vagaries of Watergate, of daily reports of the gruesome toll of the war in Vietnam, an oil crisis. 
Hooper described the general vibe of the country as being influenced by a lack of sentimentality and the brutality of things buffeting the American consciousness. Hooper began working on a new story in light of all of this, inspired by his experience at Montgomery Ward and by his disillusionment, and also by a story a doctor he knew told Hooper. During this doctor's pre-med days, the doctor made a mask from the face of a cadaver used for medical study. Thus was born the character of Leatherface, the central villain of what would become the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Kim Hinkle joined Hooper in shaping the script, and an Icelandic poet named Gunnar Hansen would step into the enormous shoes of the chainsaw-wielding Leatherface. Hansen decided to portray Leatherface as mentally handicapped and spent time at a school for developmentally disabled children where his mother worked. He studied the physicality of some of the students there, filing them away for his performance. Hooper was additionally fascinated by the story of Ed Gein, the serial killer with the maternal fetish that created lampshades of human skin. Hooper cast mostly locals to fill out the film's cast. He knew Jim Seedow personally and cast him as the sanest of the murderous clan, and Alan Danziger was given the role of Jerry based on his relationship with Hooper. The rest were largely regional theater actors, including Marilyn Burns as Sally, who had been on the UT Austin Film Commission board. For its narrator, Hooper used little-known actor John Larroquette, who would go on to achieve fame as attorney Dan Fielding on the sitcom Night Court. According to Larroquette himself, he was paid exactly one marijuana cigarette for that narration. The movie would be shot outside Round Rock, Texas. Because of the limited budget, only about $140,000, Hooper insisted his cast and crew work 16-hour days to get the shots that they needed. Add to that grueling schedule the fact that this was in a very hot and humid summer, making the already tough schedule even worse for the filmmakers. Because of the shortened schedule and small budget, Hooper did everything he could to save a buck. For one, actors were encouraged not to wash their costumes so colors wouldn't change and blood would not be rinsed away. And after several days of shooting, the clothes became rank with sweat and dried blood, some of which was real blood. Yep, some of that was actually animal blood, along with entrails taken from a local slaughterhouse and outside the house where the film was shot, a literal pile of guts baked in the Texas heat, making the air rancid with the smell of quickly decomposing viscera as temperatures would often top 110 degrees. Our director Robert Burns would also just grab roadkill along the sides of the roads to add to the pile and collect bones for all the set decoration. In this hot, desperate setting, a classic horror film was born, and some of the efforts to make it would simply not be done today. A couple of examples. One, Marilyn Burns is supposed to have her finger sliced in the film to entice the old man to drink her blood. When the special effect involving a plastic tube and a bulb filled with fake blood refused to work properly, Hooper and Burns agreed to let Seedow go ahead and cut her finger with a real razor to get the shot which she then promptly inserted into the mouth of another actor. And then there's the dinner scene as a whole, sort of the centerpiece of the movie. And the actor in the old age makeup decided he would only do one day of shooting once he got in the makeup and realized how hot it was. And so Hooper made the most of it, keeping cast and crew shooting in that remote, sweltering farmhouse for 26 straight hours. Pretty much everyone involved agrees by the end of that, and I use heavy quotes here, day, they were out of their goddamn minds. Later, they would refer to the scene as the Last Supper, and they would remember taking periodic breaks to run outside for much needed air or just to vomit. And after the marathon of shooting, the temperatures, the insanity of what they were shooting, some of the cast members remember feeling that the art was bleeding into reality. Hansen recalled later feeling that the madness of the scene infected him. He no longer thought of it as making a movie. He only knew that he was terrorizing Marilyn Burns, and that's what he was supposed to be doing, that he wanted to hurt her. Burns, for her part, thought she might have signed up for one of those snuff films rumored to exist. She worried one of the cast might actually kill her, but she was caught up in this same hysteria. 
Jim Seedow said he was reluctant to hit Burns in the head with the prop hammer during this marathon filming session. He couldn't quite bring himself to a place of violence until Burns told him, hit me, don't worry about it. And the crew, too, were screaming at Seedow, hit her, hit her harder. Seedow got swept up in the moment and he did hit her, and he hit her harder. Finally, Hooper called cut and Marilyn Burns immediately passed out. By the end of shooting, Toby Hooper acknowledged that everyone in the cast hated him to some degree. It just took years for them to kind of cool off, he said later. And during the editing, the movie's budget tacked on another $60,000, bringing it to about an even $200,000 to make this movie. Hooper, Kim Hinkle, and the rest of the cast and crew wound up selling part of their stakes in it to get a resulting 40.5% of the film's profits. But then they had to make a similar deal to get the movie distributed. And the cast and crew, after all of this insanity, were left with about $8,100 to divide among 20 or so of the filmmakers, including the cast and crew. On release, the movie got some buzz thanks to the opening narration, claiming that it was based on a true story, and it would be released annually until 1984 in certain markets. Despite the small budget, it was the 12th highest grossing movie of 1974, despite its R rating, and Toby Hooper originally believed he could get a PG rating for this film, since Little Blood can actually be seen in it. But the original rating returned by the MPAA was an X, and Hooper had to cut it just to nab the R rating. He insisted for years after that the movie was robbed of a PG rating for no good reason other than, you know, the fact that it's horrifying. All over the world, censors had trouble figuring out what to do with this movie. Britain even banned using the word chainsaw in movie titles for a while, and Australia didn't show the full version for over a decade. It fell into the video nasty category in Sweden, where it was likewise banned for a number of years. Unsurprisingly, when it was released, the reaction was mixed to say the least. There were plenty of critics of the time who thought it was exploitation, pure and simple, and worth no more than the film it was printed upon. And then there were others who saw it as something more. Deceased Pick 6 patron Roger Ebert said, quote, Horror and exploitation films almost always turn a profit if they're brought in at the right price. So they provide a good starting place for ambitious would-be filmmakers who can't get more conventional projects off the ground. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre belongs in select company with Night of the Living Dead and Last House on the Left of films that are really a lot better than the genre requires. Not, however, that you'd necessarily enjoy seeing it." End quote. Others called it the most important horror film since Night of the Living Dead. While some bemoaned its gore, others noted its almost bloodless depiction of violence. It's a rare film in which you think you see far more than Hooper ever shows you. And critic Rex Reed said it was the most terrifying film he'd ever seen, and even fellow horror director Wes Craven of Scream and Nightmare on Elm Street fame wondered, quote, what kind of Mansonite crazoid would make such a movie? Stephen King called it a work of cataclysmic terror, and many likened it to a nightmare made real on screen. It has been examined as an example of the sadism inflicted on women in film and as a skewering of the American dream in which the lowest class are abandoned and become the stuff of horror for a wandering middle class. There are papers written on its commentary on industrial capitalism, noting the failure of the local slaughterhouse as the inciting incident for the decay of the Sawyer clan. But more than any of this, it's simply terrifying. There were sequels to be sure, the direct sequel, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, is a wonderful parody of the first film and leans hard into the black comedy of the original, also directed by Toby Hooper. Then there was Leatherface, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, and then Texas Chainsaw Massacre of the Next Generation, which boasted early roles from Rene Zellweger and Matthew McConaughey. And then we come to 2003 and the remake by Marcus Nispel. Michael Bay's Platinum Dunes production company, bought the rights to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and set about the process of remaking it for no discernible reason other than they could. Originally, the film would bring back Marilyn Burns, who would tell the story as a kind of flashback, bookending a movie that retold the story of Sally and her friends and family set upon by the Sawyers. The original film was about young innocence thrown into the meat grinder. This would be a recollection of that theme, 
Kim Hinkle and Toby Hooper would write the film, but that was abandoned in favor of a script from first-time screenwriter Scott Kozar. Fun note, he also wrote the script for that terrible Amityville horror remake, too. The one holdover from the original film turned out to be cinematographer Daniel Pearl, who shot the original and the remake. The star of the film was Jessica Biel, signed on thanks to her rising stock due to her role on the show Seventh Heaven. Added to that cast was Jonathan Tucker, who was probably best known for having been in The Virgin Suicides a few years before. There's Erica Learson, playing the hippy dippy Pepper in the movie, and she starred in that Blair Witch sequel Book of Shadows three years prior to this remake. Eric Balfour, Kemper in this movie, was a recurring character on the excellent series Six Feet Under, and rounding out our victims, Mike Vogel played Andy, and he was from the television show Grounded for Life. Andrew Brynarski stepped into the role of Leatherface, having nabbed the part after the previous actor tapped for the iconic role was tossed due to health concerns. And Brynarski lobbied for the part with Michael Bay, with whom he had worked on Pearl Harbor in 2001. The unmistakable Arlie Ermey got the role of the sheriff in this film, and Ermey was foreseen in a big way thanks to his role as Gunnery Sergeant Hartman in Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket. He went on to star in lots of film and television, including Toy Story and The Frighteners and Fletch Lives, among many, many others. Some other character actors fill out the cast, but it was a stable of television actors and mostly unknowns at the time of release. To its credit, the remake was actually shot in Texas, although near Austin, and certainly not under the same conditions as the original. Daniel Pearl and first-time feature director Marcus Nispel did not want to mimic the original film's gritty style and shot the movie in a slicker, more narrative manner. Marcus Nispel was a well-established music video director, responsible for the music videos for CNC Music Factory's Things That Make You Go Hmm, and Gloria Estefan's Turn the Beat Around, among many others. The whole movie was going to cost a hair under $10 million, and it would go on to gross over $100 million worldwide. But just because it made money doesn't mean it was necessarily well-received. Our pal and resident non-breathing film critic Roger Ebert gave the movie a rare zero stars, saying it was a contemptible film, vile, ugly, and brutal. There is not a shred of reason to see it, he said. Peter Travers from Rolling Stone called it soulless and sad, contrasting the film with its original, quote, Hooper went for primitive, Nispel goes for slick. Hooper went easy on the gore, Nispel pours it on. One of the most common complaints from critics was that the film felt unnecessary. And yet the success of this movie paved the way for many of the films we're talking about this season. With that in mind, let's wrap up this intro and get to some chainsawing with the one and only Chad Cooper. Ladies and gentlemen, Leatherfaces and Sallies, it's 2003's The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And welcome back to a very special Halloween edition of Pick Six Movies. I'm one of your hosts, Bo. Oh. And, and that duck that got stepped on is the one and only Chad Cooper. Quack, quack. I take it you didn't like this movie. I don't know where you would get such an idea from the introduction. I, look, I, I think it is partially informed by the fact that i love the original texas chainsaw massacre so much i think it is a visceral frightening nightmare of a movie and when they announced that they were remaking it it's one of those things where you kind of wonder how and why and then you realize that the why is because oh somebody can make some money off of this and the how uh it turns out is badly yeah and <laughs> but I don't know how you would replicate that experience. Like in the introduction, I talk about how, how that movie was made. And I think that the sort of insanity surrounding the making of the movie kind of seeps into the film. Yeah, I think that that's absolutely true. 
And so because you just can't make movies like that anymore, because you will be arrested, I don't know that you can replicate that kind of insanity. I think that if someone were to be tasked with remaking the Texas Chainsaw Massacre right now, and they came to me, which they wouldn't, to ask how to do it, I would almost recommend doing a, not a Gus Van Sant shot for shot remake of Psycho, but just do the exact same movie with the same characters and the same everything, but filter it through a different cinematic lens. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Like the either the tone of it, but keep everything the exact same, but maybe ground it a little more in reality or present day or something like that. I, I think that that could be an interesting way to do this, but in this movie, they took the title and the chainsaw and one character, Leatherface, and they're like, we got everything we need. We're good. <laughs> right. We can make it with the title of chainsaw and the big guy. That's what people are paying to come see. Right. What about all of the rest of the family? Uh, don't matter. No. Why yeah. would you? That's People don't know that. People right. don't talk about them when they talk about this movie. They talk about Leatherface. But that's the thing. When you watch the original film, Leatherface is certainly a component of it. But Jim Seedow's character is sort of the main villain of the movie. He's the Mo. Yeah. Leatherface is pretty much the curly. Which is how it should be. Like that is Leatherface is the spice to make everything a little crazier and scarier and all that. But Jim Seedow, it's the R. Lee Ermey equivalent but without the sort of black comedy and that sort of thing. Like, I, I've said this before, but the moment where Jim Seedow comes home after Leatherface has been chasing the kids around and ended up sawing through the door, his reaction of, well, this is why we can't have nice things. <laughs> of, you know, <laughs> admonishing this mutant son of his, our brother of his, about chainsawing through the door and that that is why the house is such a mess. I only saw that original movie once when I was in middle or high school and it made a lasting impression on me. Now I've, I've said in our conversations together, you're a much bigger fan of horror movies. Well, good horror movies mm -hmm. than I am. And I just remember the scene where the woman is hung up on that meat hook and Leatherface slamming the door closed. Mm -hmm. Like I, I remember it almost as much as I remember Chainsaw and Dave reviewing this movie <laughs> from summer school. He's not going to feel that because he's crazy. I didn't want to go back and rewatch this movie because I was like, this was horrific. Like, I was good with that. And I did go back and rewatch it in preparation for this episode and I was hesitant to do it, but I was like, you know what? I'm a grown damn man. <laughs> I can handle this. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed going back and watching it decades later. I'd forgotten about Franklin, the oh. wheelchair-bound asshole of the movie, yeah. which was a real challenge in that original film to have a character who is such a dislikable person because for me i feel like you should be naturally more sympathetic to this character but he makes it really really hard uh -huh. <laughs> to like him it reminded me of when i used to watch the facts of life that nbc sitcom and blair you know the blonde headed uh, snobby one she had this cousin named jerry mm -hmm. who had cerebral palsy mm -hmm. but she was also a stand-up comic so when it was on TV, I was like, wait a minute, this is a person with a disability, but I'm supposed to laugh at them? I'm really confused by, by what type of response I'm supposed to give right now. I think the thing that makes Franklin work in the original is that the other characters are kind of done with his shit too. Yeah. Like nobody is a defender of Franklin in that movie except for Franklin. And so when he gets it, it is really satisfying, even though you're not supposed to really root for her. That is a movie that you're supposed very much to be rooting for Sally and her her friends and family with the exception of Franklin where you're like how on earth is Franklin surviving after all of these other people have been killed because he is the absolute worst and he would be the easiest to kill he can't roll away that fast he's out in a field just pick him off he's low hanging fruit passing judgment and being an asshole yeah he's so passive aggressive he's like I need the flashlight I want to hold the flashlight why won't you give me the flashlight and they're like fine take the flashlight and he's like well here maybe you should hold it 
ending. <laughs> he, he's a terrible character. And apparently, I think I've told you this story, but for the listener's benefit. But when Hooper and Daniel Pearl and Gunnar Hansen were doing director's commentary for Texas Chainsaw Massacre, like years uh-huh. after the fact, they talked about how the actor who played Franklin <laughs> was kind of a method actor. And so he was Franklin in front of the camera and behind the camera. And that nobody wanted to talk to him. That they just isolated him completely because everyone was like, you're just an asshole. Maybe the guy just was an asshole. It wasn't method acting. He was just an asshole. I think that's probably the case. And Gunnar Hansen in particular, who is this lovely, sweet guy. What a name. Yeah, Gunnar yeah. Hansen. It's terrific. How do you not become a private investigator? I think he is. Uh, <laughs> I think he does that on the side and is a poet. But yeah, Gunnar Hansen even said in the commentary, who again, very sweet, very lovely guy who doesn't have a bad thing to say about anybody uh-huh. uh, about the guy who played Franklin. He said, you know, the day we killed his character was a really good day for everybody on the set. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned that Marcus Nispel directed this movie as he did the remake of Friday the 13th featured uh-huh. on our last episode. But this movie actually came out first. And I found it interesting how many of the shots and the narrative ideas in the remake of Texas Chainsaw Massacre showed up in Friday the 13th. There's a whole lot of similarities between the two, both between Leatherface and Jason Voorhees, kind of like running through the tunnels and the way that they would just sort of pop up in different locations. It wasn't a stretch to realize the same person was behind both of these, not because they looked and felt the same, but because that Friday the 13th remake seemed to be just ripping pages out of the script of this particular movie and replicating them with more blue and gold tones. Yeah. And the problem with this in particular is that it plays like any typical slasher movie. And that's not how I see the original. I mean, it has elements of it to be sure, but it also preceded the slasher movement by four or five years. Like original Halloween was 78 and that's kind of what kicked it off. But it, it doesn't follow that formula. It's not you do a bad thing and you get murdered for it. That kind of moralistic slasher formula. It's just, hey, here's a bunch of kids who run afoul of this clan of weirdos and killers and by the way the last 20 minutes of this movie is going to be this psychotic fever dream Mm -hmm. and once Marilyn Burns jumps out of that window the movie is over in two minutes yeah you need to get through this dinner scene which is one of the most horrific things ever captured on film and (laughs) and then the movie's over and it leaves you in a place where you have survived it but you get the impression that Sally at the end of the original texas chainsaw massacre is not in a good headspace she, oh no she is going to no. be a mess <laughs> no one's years. arguing that <laughs> so but I, I i think that's a problem is that it, it fundamentally misunderstands texas chainsaw massacre as a slasher movie when that's not really what it is it's kind of like all those jaws sequels that they are like hey sharks eat people that's what this movie's about and you're like that's not what jaws is really about yeah you kind of got it all wrong all right let's jump into this one our movie starts off and it uh wastes our time with a bunch of logos of the production companies that we don't care about. I'm never going to stop harping on that. And then we get this grainy footage that looks nothing like actual black and white footage from the way back winds. And there are these filters that are applied to it to make it look like maybe like eight millimeter camera footage, but it's kind of embarrassing because the original movie starts off with what it looks like an educational or documentary type film. And as you mentioned in the introduction, it states that what you're about to see is real. So you're like, oh shit, you know? (laughs) Yeah. And this movie tries to do that, but it rings hollow because everything looks fake. From jump, it looks staged. How much weed do you think they gave John Larroquette to reprise his narrative duties for this movie? I think this was a paycheck. (laughs) I, I think they paid him in actual dollars. How about two marijuana cigarettes, Mr. Larroquette? <laughs> the story that John Larroquette was just like, I will do this narration for you, but I want pot <laughs> in exchange, <laughs> makes me unbelievably happy. It's one of my favorite stories about the original. When this opening footage starts in the remake, we see all of this black and white footage, and they're going through this crime scene, and it looks more like footage from a Ghost Hunter special over on the Learning Channel. <laughs> where legally they have to put learning in quotation marks these days. And the guy going there, like, there's a walkthrough, especially because when you get to the back end of the wraparound and realize the dipsy do that they're taking you on, mm-hmm. and you're like, what is the cameraman doing during all of this time? There's so many little... <laughs> 
details. Yeah, this sheriff's officer in black and white, he's got this giant box that's recording audio. He's got this tiny little microphone. He's like, hey, dude, it's August uh, 20th, 1973. And he's going down. I'm like, this date's a little bit important. One, because, Bo, you weren't born yet. Mm-mm. Right? No. I was born. Yeah. And which makes me your elder. So I'd appreciate a little respect. (laughs) Oh, well. I'm sorry, sir. (laughs) That's better. Look me in the eyes when you say that. Oh, yes, Um, sir. (laughs) You want a fresh one? (laughs) This deputy's holding the microphone. He's like, we're out here at the Hewitt residence, uh, Route 12, down there at Rusty's Watering Hole. You can get two for one draft thirsty Thursdays. We're going down the stairs here. Watch step. Uh, Walls here. Look over here. Got some scratches. That's suspicious. You never see scratches on the walls going down in the basement. There's some clumps of hair. And, oh, there's a fingernail. That's curious. Let's go on down this ballroom, see if there's anything else off kilter. Larry Cat chimes in. What they found was the inspiration for the good version of this movie, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I apologize for this embarrassing remake. I like the fact, too, that Larry Cat's narration, like the original narration, sort of ends with The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And in this one, it's like, oh, uh, they gave me some more to read here. <clears throat> um, <laughs> also, here's video footage of a walk a walkthrough are you sure you want to do that all right well here we go and let's uh get to the the business of the movie then and yeah so cop and then here are some kids it's l-a-r-o-q-u-e-e-t spell my name correctly on the check thank you when the narration finishes you get the title as if it's on a file folder somewhere reframing all of this movie as a police investigation which is real stupid Mm -hmm. and then you get the only i think in the movie i i didn't hear it other places but just a whiff of that that you get in the original supposedly the sound of the flash bulbs from the original movie when they're taking the shots of like the altar the shrine in the cemetery and so forth which is good and grisly and in this movie it just uses it as sort of like hey remember this sound that was essential to the opening of the original we're gonna play this faintly in the background yeah and then you hear a scream but is it a scream of fun or a scream of terror Bo? oh it's hard to say although we cut to and a bunch of kids jumping in a river they're at the swimming hole bo apparently just stopped along the way as they're driving question mm-hmm. mark and sweet home alabama plays uh-huh uh, to let us know that we are in the south yeah and as i mentioned the movie takes place in august of 1973 mm-hmm. now i don't want to get picky with details okay <laughs> oh yeah but <laughs> Why are we playing Sweet Home Alabama when our movie is taking place in Texas? I assume because they couldn't afford Freebird. Because uh, the whole deal, right, is that they're going to a Leonard Skinner concert. Yeah. And you could use that smell, I think, would be appropriate. We'll talk about that in a moment. (laughs) I also want to, again, I hate to pick nits, Uh but the song Sweet Home Alabama came out in 1974. Now, our movie's taking place in 1973, and I get that you can use music from different eras in your film, but it's just the first indication that no one gives a shit about anything in this movie. Because they're going to see Leonard Skinner, and they're talking about Freebird later on. Mm -hmm. That song didn't come out until the next year as well. You're right. It is the first and and one of the clear indications of like ah it's fine Th- nobody cares about this movie so it's fine and that's the again the frustrating thing about a movie like this remaking a classic like texas chainsaw massacre is not only do you fundamentally misunderstand what that original movie was you just clearly don't give a shit about this one in the van we have five characters which first off i like this already more than that friday the 13th remake we don't have to deal with as many knuckleheads right so let's size up our five soon to be dead 20 something so mm-hmm. the marquee actress is jessica beale uh-huh. her boyfriend is kemper he's driving this van in the middle back seat are andy and pepper and <laughs> these two are making out like andy just got out of prison and she is totally down for it this is free love just happening in the back seat while our fifth wheel Morgan Uh just watches them. You totally think that Morgan's going to be the Franklin of our movie. Because even the way he's seated, I was like, oh, he's going to be in a wheelchair too. But he's not. (laughs) Why would you play someone in a dangerous situation in this movie? They shunned such progressive and inclusive (laughs) character portrayals. Shame on you, Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake for not being more diverse. (laughs) I'm sure that Marcus Nispel was like, well, that sounds like a lot of work. Pepper comes up for air and she's like, can you believe 
leave? We didn't even know each other till yesterday. Maybe she means know him in the biblical sense. Oh, absolutely. Because <laughs> she's doing this whole like, yo, it was serendipity that you picked me up. And I like the fact that Jessica Beale couldn't roll her eyes more at this dumb dumb in the back seat that they picked up. And she knows why they picked her up. It's because she's cute. Yeah. And that Andy wanted to get it wet. Morgan, our buzzkill, he chimes in. Did you guys know that every day 33,000 people get infected with a sexually transmitted disease? I'm like, yeah, guess who's not one of them? You, Morgan. You hump. Better yet, so Kemper, Jessica Beale's boyfriend, while they're making out in the back seat, he's like, hey, you know, if you two are lovers, maybe you guys should take off your clothes. Yeah, that's kind of gross. Again, Jessica Beale rightly is like, what are you doing, you fucking person? <laughs> Pervert. Pepper pulls out a small bottle of bubbles with the plastic blow stick and she's flitting them about because she's a free spirit. And she's like, what are the odds that you would have picked me up outside of El Paso a day ago? It's synchronistically cool. And you're like, all right, I get it. You're a free spirit and you're somehow patient zero through 12 for most cross-based bumps, rashes, and itches. <laughs> Which Morgan points out and worth saying, everybody is smoking a joint and in one of the clunkiest bits of writing in the whole movie they try to hand it to jessica beale and she's like oh no thanks well she throws it out the window eric balfour as kemper is like well you didn't drink when we were in mexico too and she's like yeah i didn't want to get shit faced and out of my head in a foreign country well why would you go to mexico jessica beale that's what you do the movie is putting her front and center is like oh this is your final girl because she does not engage in illicit sex she doesn't do drugs and she does doesn't drink maybe she's pregnant did anyone stop to ask her that she was in the original script she was pregnant oh and they got rid of it because they were like i don't know that seems complicated and we're already <laughs> telling such a complicated story i want to talk about this van they're in for a minute this thing has a hula dancer doll on the dashboard uh -huh. there's also a troll doll on the dashboard on the inside of the back seat of the van there is a poster that is a, a piece of artwork featuring featuring Alfred E. Newman, spokesman extraordinaire who doesn't speak from Mad Magazine. And the whole thing just makes it look like an Applebee's on wheels. <laughs> it's like, you look around this van and you don't know what you're going to see next. An alligator wearing sunglasses. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Jessica Beale, she holds up an eight-track tape, because this is the 70s, and she says, they gotta play Freebird, man. All right, whatever. Really? You're going to go to a Leonard Skinner concert and you're worried that they're not going to play Freebird? <laughs> right. It's like, uh, we're going to see the Rembrandts, and you're like, I hope they play the theme song from Friends more than 12 times. We're going to go see the Proclaimers. <laughs> Do you think they're going to play that 500 Mile song? Here's hoping. Here's hoping. They're not Tom Waits. It's not like there's this <laughs> catalog where every song is better than the one before. It's like they got five songs that everybody knows. It's like, it's like going to see the Eagles and being like, you think they'll play Hotel California this time? No? Huh. That seems counterintuitive. It's stupid. Well, after Jessica Biel chunks the joint out the window, everybody's like, oh man, there goes our weed. And then Morgan, our annoying buzzkill, he's like, it's totally cool. We have two pounds of weed hidden in that tiny donkey pinata. And Andy, who truly could win second prize in an Owen Wilson lookalike contest, mm -hmm. he's, he kind of gives him a smack upside the head and he's like, oh hey, that was supposed to be a secret. All right, look, let's make an agreement we're not going to tell everybody especially kemper's girlfriend or this hitchhiking hottie pepper about all the weed we bought to sell at the leonard skinner concert okay i'm right here i can hear all of this she totally can't hear me i've got my hand up around the side of my mouth I, that's not how that's not how hearing works i get you're not bouncing your voice off of your hand it's still floating around she's she's talking to kemper that's not directed to me. Jessica Beale rightly is like, did we go to Mexico for you assholes to buy a lot of weed and bring back illegally into the country? Yes, Jessica Beale. Why do you think we went to Mexico? You didn't drink. You didn't get shit faced. You didn't go with us to the donkey pinata weed store. That's the whole reason we go. Have you ever been to Mexico before? And Kemper is like, no, baby, I'm not a drug smuggler. What do you think? And... 
the thing is, aside from the fact that both this and the Friday the 13th remake both feature weed prominently in the first 20 minutes. Right? Yes. But it goes away and it never comes back. And yeah. un unlike the Friday the 13th movie where theoretically the hillbilly with the wood chipper is murdered on account of stealing weed. But yeah. they've got this pinata full of pot and Jessica Biel is pissed off. But also she says that she wants Kemper to put a ring on it mm -hmm. which makes me wonder if her judgment is not impaired in some way sure because why on earth would you want to be with this lantern chawed freak who seems to have one job skill and that is poorly smuggling drugs one other thing i want to point out as a big differentiator between this movie and the original everyone in this movie is incredibly attractive they are oh, yeah. all very handsome beautiful easy on the eyes people everyone in the original they look like regular uggos there are degrees of attractiveness and i get that that's subjective but these are like hollywood actors as you mentioned in the introduction these were people that they just like shouted out of their vw bug hey want to be in a movie and they're like sure and they got in and made a movie <laughs> yeah it was a bunch of yahoos that lived in and around austin yeah in the original casting and but i think that's what totally works about it right is like they do look like normal people they're not gorgeous unattainable icons and whatnot and that yeah and and totally in this movie it is a bunch of beautiful tv actors that were assembled a, as some kind of justice league of gorgeousness right they find another hitchhiker though jessica beal and kemper they start making out while he's driving which kids don't do that okay and then as they're driving these two come up for air and jessica beal screams look out and he like slams on the brake and swerves around to miss this woman who's just walking down the middle of the road of this long texas highway and then the pinata falls over and the weed kind of pops out to let us know that oh they definitely got the weed they find this girl wandering dazed and it's pepper and jessica beale that get out of the van oh wow are you okay hey it's serendipity terrius what's your astrological sign can i read your tarot cards and this girl just says i gotta get away i want to go home my friends are hurt where's the hospital <laughs> Yeah. Oh, well, how about you get in this van with us? We're all getting naked in a minute. I just want to go home. And so they just cram her. They abduct this woman from the side of the road, throw her in this van. And here they drive past the Blair Meat Company. Wait, wait, wait what is that? And then is the, the van goes by, the camera pauses on a couple of rotting cattle heads out front of this place. Not the kind of thing that the food and safety inspectors would easily overlook. This is certainly a tip of the hat i think to the stuff in the original about the slaughterhouse having closed down but it's just so like lazy and you'll miss it yeah it just doesn't really matter it is important for the unnecessary finale of this movie and again just like in the friday the 13th remake this movie in my opinion assumes you did the required reading like you're showing up just out of curiosity to see what a remake of a movie you've already seen was like if you just watched this with a critical eye there are so many things in this narrative that don't connect at all. This is one of them. I don't think they ever really mention anything about people working in a slaughterhouse, which is good because later, bro, guess what? We don't ever see anybody in this slaughterhouse. Nobody's working there and it's not shut down. One presumes not. And we'll talk about the old mill later and how that relates to anything, but it yeah. doesn't and <laughs> all right so they've got this girl in the back seat of the van and they're like hey what's wrong with you you seem to be distressed and crying silently weeping to yourself as if you sustained a horrible trauma and she says they're all dead and they're like who's all dead and jessica beale rightly says to kemper hey we need to take her to a hospital well babe how about you show me where one is huh i don't know where a <laughs> hospital is and she's like oh god damn it i don't know why i'm with you all right so <laughs> what happened back there and the girl's like wait a second where are you going you're going the wrong way you're going yeah. the wrong way and she lunges forward and tries to grab the wheel like trump in that secret service car mm -hmm. and they end up screeching to a stop on this lonesome texas road and this girl that they picked up says i won't go back there and then does this magic trick where she reaches under her dress and pulls out a revolver mm -hmm. 
one assumes using her cooch as a holster for this thing. Yes, she had a gun tucked up in her vagina. Uh huh. And she pulls the gun out. Right. Puts the barrel in her mouth and blows a hole out the back of her head. Well, before she does that, she says he's a bad man, and then tells everyone in the van, "You're all gonna die." And then she eats the bullet. Hmm. And we get one of a couple of shots because Marcus Nispel is in love with this, where the camera pulls out through the hole in her head and through the windshield. It's like something from a Barry Sonnefeld or Sam Raimi movie. It insists upon itself. It's like, look at this. When it happens once, it's like, okay, that's a cool shot. But on the second and third times that it happens, you're like... I get it. You're very fancy. I disagree. I don't think it was that cool the first time, especially for a movie like this. It, that kind of stuff works in Men in Black or something that's more either cartoonish or cinematically stylish. Like the movie drawing attention to the way in which it's shot, it's okay. Maybe I just thought that this is a movie that, well, should be more subtle, but I didn't realize where we were going to go for the next 82 minutes, which is it, absent of subtlety. There's not a subtle bone in this film's body. No. But so every Everyone scrambles out of the van and there is another shot inside the van of the girl who has shot herself with her head leaned back and you see smoke kind of curling out of her mouth. I'm glad they showed some restraint and didn't have the camera go up her vagina through <laughs> her body cavity, out her mouth, through the smoke. Yeah, I think that was probably just too much work. And also talking about the subtlety in the original, in the original, the hitchhiker they pick up is a guy and he's a weirdo. Mm -hmm. They're picking him up just sort of as, as a sign of the times that hitchhiking was much more common than it is now. And, you know, this guy, when he gets in the van, they immediately know this was a mistake. Like, this guy's off in his head. And he takes pictures of them and wants them to buy them. They say no, and he, he sets it on fire. It's all very unnerving. And the scene is drawn out for, I'm going to say, a considerable amount of time. I think the original movie is like barely 80, 85 minutes. And they pack a lot into that short period of time. But during this sequence, you're just like, hey, we need to get this dude out of our van. He's got bad mojo. This movie making it a young woman and that she pulls a gun out and just blows her head all over the inside of this van. The, just the differences between those two starting points of the story is reflective of everything that's wrong with this one that they didn't do from the original. Again, the original is so much about the idea of like these innocent kids just being thrown into this horrific situation where they just get chewed up. And that is the first salvo of that. And it kind of leans on the idea of being polite. We pick this guy up because because we're decent people and not because we wanted to get laid right and when he's first weird they all kind of play along with it a little bit like okay yeah. he's maybe he's on drugs maybe it's fine he's he's a little bit weird and off kilter but that's fine but it's when he starts like cutting himself and trying to mm -hmm. cut the dude in the back of the van with him yeah. that it's like oh we got to get him out it has crossed a line he's a danger to himself and most importantly others right. and by others i mean me get out that is sort of the first indication in the movie that oh you're you're not in Kansas anymore kind of thing. Yeah. A as opposed to this. Also, more blood in this opening scene than in the entire original film. Dude, there's more blood between her thighs when she pulls that gun out of her vagina than there was in the yeah. original movie. And the first one is still much more terrifying. Pepper gets out of the van and she throws up. Yeah. And then she starts blaming this dead hitchhiker for their predicament. Oh, wow, man, why did she have to pick us? And then Morgan, our jackass, he gets out and he's screaming about how all the cops are going to show up and they're going to find all of the marijuana inside the donkey pinata and i'm like you know what at least morgan has his eye on the prize well kemper at that point is like you know what you're right we can't have this pot in here and we've got to call the police so i'm making the executive decision to take this pinata full of weed walk it over to the field beside us and just hurl it as far as i can yeah there's a couple of cows over in that field and they're like Ooh, we're gonna get so hot go over there and eat it we got four stomachs to make this one of the <laughs> best days of our life hey moo have you ever eaten grass moo of course that's all i eat no moo have you ever eaten grass <laughs> have you ever given milk on weed this is the dawning of the age of aquarius and when jessica beale finds kemper on the side of the road he says look babe i just did that weed thing so we could start a life together to use the, the illicit funds i used smuggling drugs into the country <laughs> to make sure that we had a good start in life uh -huh. It, this is totally unlike anything that happened in the movie Goodfellas, so I was pretty sure that it would all work out for everybody. Pepper shouts out, Man, I'm never getting back in that van again. Everybody's back in the van. 
cut to everyone in the van <laughs> with Andy looking at this backseat going, huh, I guess that's what Brains looks like. Kind of like lasagna. Oh, yeah, look at that. I've never seen that before. When he says that it looks like lasagna, again, jokes like that don't belong in a movie like this. Or does that define his character as being the goofy jokester? And he's not. In fact, we're going to talk about a scene a little bit later where Morgan goes and starts pulling off practical jokes that are completely out of line with his character. The characters don't behave consistently with how they should. They're just all over the place because it's just a terrible movie. And very badly written, right. So they find a gas station where there's this crotchety old woman behind the counter chain smoking. Uh Uh-huh. And they all get out to basically file this report, like get to a phone, call the police, and Jessica Biel and Pepper dovetail to go to a outhouse. They have to powder their noses. Yeah. And so the guys go into this <laughs> grocery store, convenience mm-hmm. store, and ask to call the sheriff. Kemper says, ma'am, we need to report a suicide. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> and Andy, meanwhile, is leaned down looking at a bunch of pig parts in the counter like, oh, wow, look at all these pig pieces, man. <laughs> this is just really great. Look at all those flies. Oh, wow. It's so over the top of this rotting meat, which they don't ever really explain any of that. It's just there to be gross and creepy like there's a full-size hog head that's rotting there the stench of that would be you wouldn't be able to be in the same room with it absolutely especially with all these flies laying maggot eggs all over it and stuff anyway so jessica beal outside picks the lock keeping this outhouse closed Mm -hmm. and so letting us know as the audience that she can do stuff like this yeah she says something about she learned that in juvie which i was like also hey didn't somebody pick a lock in the friday the 13th remake Ooh, let's do that. Right. <laughs> uh, so this old woman behind the counter says, well, you're going to need to go to Old Crawford Mill to make your report. Otherwise, it's going to be two hours. Kemper is like, hey, we're not driving around with some dead girl in the back of my van, man. What you do is your business. Yeah. You won't need to get out of here, no go here. So they, that, that's what they do at left <laughs> end of pass. Yeah. They just all pile <laughs> back in the van and go to the, quote, old mill, which, mm-hmm. hey, how did they know where the old mill is? Mm. I reckon on you just go down here you go to turn on left and then you go wreck on you go go up here till you see the hill and then you wreck on and you go around by the way i'm from louisiana i'm i reckon i'm not originally from texas uh-huh. you know where that old house got burned down two years ago you know little jim and big jim well you, you go past little jim's house but not past big jim house turn when you turn you turn left and you turn right then you turn back around and then you be at the old mill you figure it out now uh-huh. so that's where they go this van they're in they give a shot of it it has rear wheel mud flaps with the naked lady silhouette and and there are two bumper stickers on this car, but one of them says hippie chicks rule. And then the other one says shit happens. The latter of which was a phrase that wasn't popularized until the 1980s. Yeah. Just put a don't have a cow man bumper sticker on this car while you're at it. <laughs> yeah. Right. One of those coexist bumper stickers. <laughs> <laughs> Baby on board sign. We cut that from the script. Oh shit. I kind of understand of like, okay, well this is the two warring philosophies of like, oh, hippie chicks rule. But also there's this random violence that can find the kids, but it just doesn't work in this movie. And again, unlike the original where it was very clear that Hooper was sort of making a comment about how young people were being chewed up by the war and by society in general and so forth that like these were all relatively decent people the problem with this movie is I don't like Jessica Biel because she's too judgmental and I don't like any of the (laughs) other characters because they're just terrible people I got we got a bus full of Franklins here (laughs) what am I supposed to do with that Chad I can't get behind that I can't get behind a bus full of Franklins I just want them all to die then you start rooting for leather face and you're like well i don't know if that's what i'm supposed to be doing honestly arlie ermy is the only character in this movie that i find entertaining he's entertaining i don't know that he's necessarily very likable they finally reach the old crawford mill wherever that is and they get out of the van and kemper shouts hello sheriff he's not there and then morgan says something sensible which was hey why don't we just dump her dead body and get the hell out of here and jessica Biel's like no we are not going to do that i understand her perspective like she's just trying to be a 
decent person and not dump a body. But also, once you were in a situation where the woman behind the counter told you to meet the sheriff at, quote, the old mill, Uh and you show up there and no one is around, you have carte blanche Yeah, to, hey, we are going to prop her up. We're going to National Lampoon's vacation this, where we put a little sign on her. Sorry, your problem now. Catch me if you can. They take a vote, and the vote to leave the body wins, but Jessica Biel just vetoes it all because she is, again, the judgmental ruler of this van, where she's like, we're absolutely not going to do it. I thought Kemper was team keep the body because he was trying to get back in good with the missus. When she looks at him, he's like, babe, it's, you know, we could leave right <laughs> now. We got tickets to the concert. And- yeah, it's 1973. DNA evidence isn't a thing yet. Just leave her body. We'll smash out the back window to get rid of that blood. When we get to the concert, we set the van on fire and we right. buy a new one. Right. We just look for the nearest car wash. We hose this thing down and we're good yeah. to go. Put a little duct tape in the back window. Done and done. I mean, who has not seen a duct tape window in a VW van? Take down the Alfred E. Newman poster. Put it over the back window. Nobody's going to mess with us. But of course they hear something coming from inside. Oh, good God. This old mill. And <sighs> so we get our first fake scare of the movie, which is Jessica Beale discovering a possum. But then they find this feral Mad Max kid named Jedediah who's living in the mill, question mark. Speaking of good looking actors, this child actor, he looks like he belongs in a commercial for McDonald's or something. Do you know what I mean? Except for the And they've tried teeth. to ugly him up by smearing soot on his face and they gave him these teeth prosthetics that are so large like they bulge out from under his lips and like his eyes sparkle when he talks he doesn't have that dead-eyed look of a child that's been raised in the old crawford mill if you wiped off his face and got him some dental work he would be ready for a calvin klein commercial to just close his mouth but i mean the kid's adorable looking but he's he's supposed to be this feral wild child so this kid says what did y'all do to that girl in the van excuse me sorry let me try that again um what did y'all do i'm sorry 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 just a moment please (laughs) draw upon your training brian you can do this what did you all do to that girl in the damn it i had it and then i lost it kemper is the one who says oh that oh she did that to herself dude that one us (laughs) they finally fish the name of this kid out of him jedediah and they're like hey where is the sheriff by the way and he goes he's at home getting drunk pardon me one second uh, take two he's back at home getting drunk was that better marcus i think i've got another one in me <clears throat> all right how about one for you one for me one for just for fun jessica veal and kemper go wandering off to find this drunken sheriff which at this point if i'm jessica veal i'm like you know what we made best effort we found this weirdo possibly <laughs> british kid who told us the sheriff is and i quote at home getting drunk so you know what i have swung my vote over to team let's leave the body because you have no one in authority at this point or you put the body back in the van oh it's still in the van but you at at this point you just drive to the next town and tell your story to someone who looks like they are in authority instead of wandering through the woods to find this drunken sheriff who by the way might shoot you because of his drunken state to compare and contrast the original in the original they're in the van they pick up the weird guy he gets super weird they drop him off and then they go to an old homestead that's affiliated with two of the characters in the van they get there and then two of the characters just go off to explore like they're just sort of looking around just the way you would probably do Like, what's over here? This movie, from the start, we have a violent suicide, corrupt drunken sheriffs. We've got this dollar store version of Newt from Aliens running around. We've got this slaughterhouse. Yeah. It's it's too much. It's it's a hat on a hat on a hat. And as we're following Kemper and Jessica Biel, we walk by some abandoned cars and trunks open with, like, skeletons hanging out of them. And signs that say, turn back now. And they're just like, oh, I wonder what that's about. And so they just keep (laughs) trucking along. Meanwhile, Andy has to chase off this kid who's poking this dead body in the back with a stick. He's like, oh, wow, man, you can't do that to dead people. Get out of here. And so this kid goes off running away. And then we cut back to Jessica Beale and Kemper, who have found this house in the middle of nowhere. They think they've arrived at the sheriff's house. It's like a plantation-style mansion in the middle of nowhere. So they bang on the door, and up to the door 
door comes this old man in a wheelchair, one presumes our Franklin stand-in, who has no legs below the knees. He screams out, who is it? Jessica Veal says, hi, are you the sheriff? Which, I swear to God, she asked the stupidest questions. Are they going to play Freebird? Is this man with no legs in a wheelchair <laughs> the sheriff? The sheriff of this Maybe town. that's why it's going to take him two hours to get there. <laughs> I'll get there in a minute. This is old Monty, who rightfully says, I look like the sheriff. He's like, step away from my door. I'm coming out. <laughs> so he comes out and old Monty says, Sheriff, don't remember. You can call him if you want to. So old Monty goes back inside, forcing Kemper to remain outdoors. Like, you can't go in, but she can't. So Jessica Beal goes inside. She gets on the phone and she says, hello, is this the sheriff? Okay, can I speak to the sheriff? And then we cut back to the van where the sheriff has now shown up. And it is Arlie Ermey as the sheriff. And he apparently goes to the same eyebrow groomer as Andy Rooney. <laughs> These eyebrows are insane. Or Brad Dourif from the movie Dune, <laughs> where the eyebrows are literally past his skull. <laughs> or the monarch from the Venture Brothers. I mean, yes. they're just, they're crazy big. So he gets out of this police car, promptly spits some chaw on the ground. And it runs down his chin like diarrhea. And he circles around to the bloody hole in the rear windshield and he says i'm just gonna take an educated guess looking through this hole here that my money is that the body is in that van and then we immediately cut away from this back to Jessica Beale, who's still on the phone. And the woman says, the sheriff will be there in 30 minutes. Then we cut back to Arlie Ermey, who's already there, Bo, which I thought, oh, Arlie Ermey isn't the real sheriff. He's an imposter. That's right. But is he the real sheriff? I, it's a fine question. I think so. Because otherwise, you would have someone showing up, or it's just a badly written film chat. Or maybe they just edited it incorrectly. Like, that scene of 30 minutes should have happened 18 seconds earlier. Yeah. Because, like, oh, he'll be there in 30 minutes. Cut to him arriving. Like, oh, well, 30 minutes has passed since that edit happened. So after she wraps up this phone call, though, this old man, old Monty, is calling for her to come help. Help! Help! I fell in the bathroom, pretty girl! Emptying a colostomy bag in Texas. Texas's shittiest toilet. What is that pink Pepto Bismol smoothie sludge coming out of the faucet? No idea. Did you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, like I, it looked like yeah. Ghostbusters 2. It's just this pink ooze coming out of the sink faucet. What is that? Yeah. Besides I, gross and off-putting. You could make the argument, I suppose, that it is to set the stage for like this house that's filthy and all of that, but I don't know. Like I don't need it to go into the ins and outs of this house's plumbing or anything. Right. But it would be nice if they were just like, we don't have running water here or something. Yeah, weird shit like that makes sense in a movie like that adaptation of The Avengers that we saw with uh, Sean Connery and mm -hmm. Ray Fiennes, where there were visually unexpected elements, but you were telling this sort of abstract, artsy-fartsy film, and you're like, oh, okay, this is just weird. It's like a dream state. But in this movie, they do a lot of this, and it's just confusing. Like, this is a simple story that should be told simply, and you're just introducing all of this noise that is confusing. What should my focus as the viewer be on? The water running or this guy on the floor or it's just too much but so Kemper by the way gets suspicious and comes inside to look for Jessica Beale, who's getting her ass grabbed by old Monty as she tries to hoist him up back onto his chair this is the closest he gets to a good time but anyway <laughs> so back at the van Sheriff Arlie Ermey finds the gun and says so you're telling me maggot that this gun was brought here by this woman in her vagina and they're like oh well maybe and yeah, that's what we're telling you, brother. It, it was the craziest thing. She just pulled it out of nowhere. Oh, wow. Then he smells it. Yeah. He gives it a good... And I'm like, Bleh. and then Chad puts it back in his empty ankle holster, letting you know immediately we need to get away from this guy. Now, was his putting the gun back into his ankle holster meant to tell us that that was his gun I believe that she so. had stolen? Yes. Or that he was just a collector of vagina smelling firearms and this was going to be added to his growing arsenal? I think that this is one of 
of the clearer, more subtle moments of the movie, which doesn't have a ton of them. But I do think this actually is a nice moment of like, oh, this is his gun. And that is the visual cue to put those pieces together. I don't need you to spoon feed a movie to me, but in a movie like this, all I need is him picking up the gun instead of him sniffing it like a pervert, have him turn it over and have some sort of inscription property of Hillbilly County Sheriff's Department. Right. And then put it back in his holster. It's very clear. So meanwhile, Kemper is wandering through this house, which has literal pigs running free. At first, I thought maybe that was their security system. Like, you just let the pigs run around the house instead of having dog barks. Like, if the pigs start squealing, somebody's in here. Somebody showed up selling pigs door to door. Here at Pig Pro, we can make sure that you are going to be alerted to the sound of any intruder. We have a variety of models. Uh, How light a sleeper are you? What level of oink will wake you? Uh, I I sleep heavy. I don't know that these piglets are going to do it for me do you have a full-sized hog grunting noises would be the type of thing to wake me from my slumber we do but let me pitch this to you uh pigs it turns out are kind of scalable in terms of their care so how about instead of one giant pig we Mm -hmm. give you three smaller pigs whoa 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 i didn't come in here to buy three pigs i came in here to buy one large alarm pig what are you trying to do upsell me what if i tell you that if you buy the the two smaller pigs the third one's free I'm listening. Yeah, so we have these (laughs) pig pro oinkers running around doing their job because as soon as Kemper (laughs) sees them, they're like... (laughs) Kemper makes his way into this sewing room filled with creepy mannequin heads. Uh Uh-huh. I've got one similar. There's also a torso used for making dresses. There's a record player spinning with the needle down, but no music is playing. Again, what do you do in movie? Kemper goes to this door and he creaks it open. And on the other side is a TV playing black black and white public domain cartoons. And then Kemper sees a collection of heart charms hanging off of a bracelet that's on the wall. And then they drop down to the floor. Who knows why these are here? He leans over to pick them up. And wouldn't you know it, Bo, our mystery man pops out from the shadows and clocks Kemper on the head with a sledgehammer. Leatherface drags him back into the house and slams the door a la the original film. It's so much less effective. That scene in the original is something that will stick with you forever. It happens so fast is the thing. It's just door opens, conk, grab the dude door slam shut all in the space of like what four seconds Mm -hmm. and it's terrifying and this one it's just again it's much more drawn out also it's the stark kind of documentary style of of that original movie so that the camera doesn't do a lot of cuts there's not close-ups and then wide shots it's just that one medium shot of the door right and it's really very stark and terrifying and and this is a little too slick looking yeah jessica beale hears the oink co alarm system go off <laughs> yeah. and she goes running for kemper leaving old monty on the floor to sniff his fingers after having them in her ass crack for the better part of the last five minutes and so the movie and this movie does this a lot it really bounces back and forth between scenes which never allows the suspense to build it's like right when things are starting to get good it's like oh yeah we've got this other part of our movie going and so we jump back over there now i think something like that works very well in action films But in a film like this, where you're trying to create something that's more atmospheric and you're building that tension, it just breaks it up. And you're not focusing on anything long enough to have the effect that you're, I'm assuming, trying to achieve. It's not trusting the audience to be with the movie enough to get invested in the scene. And, you know, I was telling you just recently, I was rewatching Poltergeist. And there's that whole sequence in the movie where in between the scares, there's just a big conversation about what are ghosts and what is life after death and all of that stuff and it certainly informs the movie but it's one of the best moments in the film i think because it's so low-key kind of creepy as this young child is asking about the nature of the spirit world and this professor is doing her level best to try to explain it and it goes on for a long time it's a long scene this is the scene where he talks about the mean kids at school yeah yeah Yeah. but and i think that that's Spielberg. Perhaps so. You need to slow your movie down at times to let the audience catch their breath before you ramp things up. I don't know. Well, sometimes you need to do that. But I think in a movie like that, if you're just overwhelming people with so much, it just becomes too much. Having those pauses allows you to reset and get ready for the next block of craziness that you're going to give them. And it gives you this insight into the characters and also the nature of the story that you're telling. 
Mm -hmm. in equal measure like there are so many moments in that film that are just genius bits of dialogue there's that great moment where joe beth williams says hey i was talking to your grandma about all the drinks that she's got planned when you go to visit her and it's like oh okay so he's about to leave the movie for a little bit and i know where he is and i know the relationship and all of that stuff and it's all done in one line this movie doesn't do it right that's none of those moves where it could very succinctly and naturally explain the behaviors and actions of its characters and speaking of back at the van here's the thing with jedediah our kid how about this where are your parents and he, just him saying like i haven't seen my parents for a long time yeah and you're like oh his parents were killed that's not what happens because later he calls somebody grandma and you're like wait what if she's your grandma who are your parents like anyway right it, it drives me bonkers that there's so many things in this movie that are just loose ends that are intentionally placed as a loose end or they just didn't realize you can't put something like this in the movie and not have it have purpose i want to hear from marcus nispel saying there's a director's cut of this that's two and a half hours long that answers all of these questions (laughs) but i I just don't believe that's true i think that there is a director's cut that's 30 minutes shorter that prevents all of these questions that would also be fun (laughs) we come back to the van and sheriff arlie ermy he pulls out this long roll of plastic right he's like get over here maggots we gotta wrap up this body give me a hand hup And so Andy comes over and starts helping out and they just start cocooning this suicide corpse with saran wrap. Dude, Arlie Ermey at this point is also saying things like, oh, this reminds me of my old days when we used to find the dead body of a real cutie like this. Cop ourselves a little feel, you know what I mean? He grabs the corpse's breast when he's wrapping it up and then he comments about, looks like she's wet between her thighs. What you boys doing with this dead body? Up, two, three, four, maggot. We also get a glimpse of this Jedediah kid kind of watching all this through the window so we remember that he's a thing so later when he shows up at the end of the movie we're like oh yeah that kid right again we leave that scene because we can't finish a thought in this movie correct to go to back to Jessica Beale who's hunting around for Kemper who as we know has been conked in the head and taken into Leatherface's lair and she finds that door that got slammed shut and sees an eye hole kind of moving around like Leatherface mm-hmm. has the this advanced security system from Oinko. <laughs> hey, we can put a, a moving eye hole in the door too. Like, yeah, we definitely want that. So Jessica Beale goes back to old Monty and is like, where's my boyfriend? And let's just say I'm thinking about we're going to take a break once we get back from this trip, but he's my boyfriend for now. And old Monty is like, he ain't in my house. And so she just leaves. What's she going to take his word for? Was she going to call him a liar? He let her use the phone for free. Fair enough. So we go back to the van where Arlie Ermy has Andy and Morgan moving this body to his car after they've wrapped it up in saran wrap. Yeah. And Pepper, watching all this, says oh this seems so wrong and sheriff harley army says what are you saying maggot i have as much respect for a dead body as it wait a second are you putting that goddamn body in my the back seat of my car you put it in the trunk which is as close to a good joke as this movie ever comes does this movie even need jokes though like that does it need them no i mean i know that it's kind of aiming at the dark comedy of the first one and it just doesn't have the chops for it yeah the arlie army character is this guy who clearly delights in torturing these people like he knows that he's going to kill them and they don't know that so he's just having fun he uses an excessive amount of profanity and he, he almost seems cartoonish in a so yeah maybe that's giving the filmmakers way too much credit i don't think they did any of that so arlie ermy hops in his sheriff's car and he drives off the movie cuts back to jessica beale wandering around looking for kemper then we cut to leatherface's workshop Mm -hmm. which is full of these severed ears and there's fingers that have been cut off what appears to be dentures there's a shot of a severed head Mm -hmm. of famed film critic harry knowles from ain't it cool news.com perhaps infamous at this point for those of you who don't know harry knowles from ain't it cool news he was this film critic from the early days of the internet and he lived in austin texas and his site was popular it was influential in movies being considered good 
good or bad before they were released? Like, wasn't he courted by George Lucas on some of those prequels to Star Wars or something like that? Yeah, he was a real shill. He got taken down a peg or two for sexual harassment or something like that? Sure. He was a fat nerd who got a taste of fame and threw that fame around so that he could get his jollies. And basically he and the site were banished in disgrace, which is probably for the best because it was, yeah. like you were saying, it was one of those sites where you couldn't trust it because... Because he was showing up in movies like this? Not only that, he would get invited to a set by Michael Bay and would tell you that the Transformers was going to be the best movie that had ever been. And then you saw it and you are like, this movie is garbage. And the yeah. only reason you said this is because you wanted to star fuck Michael Bay and go to sets and private screenings. Yeah. Leatherface takes some shears out and he removes Kemper's shirt from the back. And then he grabs some large hooks and you're like, oh, the tension's building. Let's see what happens next. Cut away to Jessica Biel just walking off in the woods. And then Arlie Ermy driving over some dirt roads because that's a <laughs> shot we needed too. Because as an audience, you're thinking like, huh, I wonder if Arlie Ermy is driving right now. I last saw him in his car and he was driving, right. but is he still driving? If I see him somewhere else, I'm not sure I'm going to buy that he drove there. He may have parked and walked there. Could you fill in those gaps in the movie? It's one of those <laughs> things, man, that it's a simple thing in cinema, but like you saw him get in a car. <laughs> I don't need to see the edit of him driving just to have him show up somewhere else later. I can fill in that gap, like you said. It's so heavy scratching it makes me crazy watching this movie and so we see pepper almost puking again <laughs> i think i think we know who's pregnant <laughs> as jessica bill shows back up to say oh the sheriff is on the way and they're like uh he's already been here this is another moment where i was like so is arlie ermy the real sheriff who knows I, right it's a fun question i the movie doesn't ever tell you for sure but it's not a mystery question that the filmmakers are like we want you to question that the whole time i think it's just poor filmmaking just make him the sheriff like in the like, quit, quit dance around all of this unnecessary timelines and misdirection he's got to be the sheriff he has a sheriff's patrol car like a regular citizen can't just drive around in a sheriff's car uh can't you like you can get one of those at auction <laughs> like the blues brothers yeah <laughs> got cop wheels <laughs> cop tires <laughs> cop engine da, 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 da. all right jessica beale is surprised by the fact that kemper isn't with them and so now everybody goes looking for kemper Sure, why not? And so they hear a car horn, so they follow the sound of the horn to one of those abandoned cars that we saw earlier, only somebody has just wedged a stick against the horn. Who? Who, Bo? And why? I, maybe Arlie Ermy, maybe Leatherface, certainly not maybe Old Maybe the Mondi, kid? Maybe the kid. A bird? One of those pigs? One of the possums that we saw in the factory? I think it was probably the sales representative from Oinko who came in and said, now look, we know you did the buy two, get one free pigs. Perfect. We threw in the door eye hole for free. I know you're considering the empty aluminum cans on string for your doors around your house that clink clank when people walk through them. But let me tell you, we've got a brand new product on the market. I'm not showing this to everybody, but just you because you are a loyal customer at Oinko. It's called car horn stick. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's how it works. You take car horn stick, you jam it in the car between the seat and the horn. The horn goes off, setting off an alarm. Now, the boys back in R&D haven't quite figured out how this keeps people from stealing your car, but it does. Buy one now, and it'll, I'll take 25% off manufactured retail sales price just for you today. While they're looking around, Andy finds this dental appliance. It's like, oh, wow, look, someone's teeth, man. And Pepper what? flips out about it. Well, she has has seen a girl commit suicide a feral child she saw the corpse wrapped up in plastic she's thrown up a couple of times she's only known these people for 24 hours everybody's got their breaking point though i hope the sex with andy was worth it because her life has turned into absolute shit since these people <laughs> picked her up at best she was going to go to a leonard skinner concert <laughs> that's if everything went right so it was never going to be that great <laughs> So Morgan reaches into this car and then does a scream like, oh, it's got me. This made me so angry because Morgan is arguably the most sensible one of the bunch. And he just sticks his arm in the rusty hole of this brown Studebaker's trunk. And he's like slow all in there. And then he's like, ah, ah, ah. 
And then he pulls out and he's laughing. Yeah. You're not the jokester of the bunch at all. Andy would have maybe done that because he made the lasagna comment earlier. But not Morgan. You're better than this. <laughs> is he? No. And what does he pull out, Bo? Riddle me this. What in the hell is this thing that he pulls out? It's a jar with water or formaldehyde or some kind of preservative maybe. Which And? Which is, it has on one side a picture of the girl what shot herself inside it. And then you turn it over though. And it's a picture of a family with her in the picture also. So it's like a picture of her. And then the other side of it is a picture of her with her family, including this chubby cheeks child that we will see in a bit. So it's two photos in a jar filled with liquid in the trunk of a car. Yes. None of this is necessary. You know where you, they should have found those pictures? Laying in the back seat. Like, <laughs> yeah. he shouldn't have stuck his arm into a trunk. That thing could be full of raccoons and not the cute kind. The kind that bite you. And I don't know how he he saw it is the thing he, it, he didn't it is maddening how much just stupid shit like this happens in this movie and more importantly we didn't see suicide girl long enough at least i didn't to make an impression of her face or or put a flower barrette in her hair something that says that's her because when i looked at the picture on the back i kind of thought it was her but i wasn't sure and then when they turn around and you see the family photo i was like which one is the girl i just saw is that suicide girl is that her baby was she bleeding earlier because she'd given birth no that that can't be right because this kid's too big it's just so poorly constructed and it doesn't need to be it's super frustrating but they all just resolve at this point like we need to find kemper and then get out of here mm, grab horn stick we might come across another car later <laughs> and so andy and jessica beale go looking after andy is like hey man how about you let me hang on to the car keys for a while and she's like no because you're just <laughs> the kind of asshole that would take off and leave everybody like, what oh wow no what no i would never Never do such a thing let's make an agreement okay you give me the keys and i promise that i won't leave within the next 15 minutes okay but she pockets the keys to keep everybody there yeah so we do a quick cutaway to leatherface with kemper and he finds a ring in his pocket presumably meant as an engagement ring for jessica beale mm -hmm. as he's hanging kemper up on his hooks but that again it's just a, a quick cutaway and then we go back to jessica Beal and and let me ask you this though please so kemper you know before he got clocked on the head he was going to propose to jessica beale at a leonard skinner concert <laughs> after they had road trip to mexico to buy two pounds of weed hidden in a donkey pinata and <laughs> yeah. this road trip involved them picking up a hitchhiker named pepper that had sex with andy in the back seat of the car and kids that's how i met your mother well he's a romantic chad you know and in fairness i think it was andy that was pushing for the pepper pickup uh i think yeah. kemper would have been fine with hey we're just <laughs> going to go to this concert but it was andy stuck with morgan to talk to the entire time right. and between the two of them that's just the most irritating conversation you're ever going to get <laughs> pepper was the at least someone was pepper somebody that you w would want to sit down and have a deep conversation with of course not but compared to morgan better yeah better than morgan or andy <laughs> uh, individually a hundred percent you know it's a real devil's bargain that you're making here jessica veal and andy they go back to old monty's plantation house of horrors and old monty he's sitting out in the front yard in his wheelchair petting his small dog that he apparently has now and jessica beale goes over to chat him up and be a bit of a distraction and she's like hi i don't know if you remember me or not i'm sure you get a lot of visitors out here in the middle of nowhere i'm jessica beale and i'm looking for my boyfriend kemper tall guy pencil thin mustache definitely still alive do you have you seen him and while she's chatting him up andy just makes his way into this plantation house and he do -si does around and he wanders around but he doesn't immediately set off the oinko pig system andy also has has this plus shaped tire iron yeah, it's a lug wrench um, yeah like that's his weapon in case something happens it's highly impractical but you improvise when you have to and andy goes to the kitchen and there's all kinds of random meat hanging from the ceiling as well as a pair of blood soaked women's pantyhose and here he finds the latest innovation from oink co security systems which is a live chicken which is a subsidiary of oink co which is cluck co yeah a tiny little division of oink co yeah the pigs from oinko they do come around the, the corner but he doesn't set them off because he's pretty stealthy and then andy who's looking for his friend kemper proceeds to open 
the refrigerator, which is full of more rotting meat and perishables. Does he think Kemper is hiding in the fridge? Why would he open the refrigerator? I think he's is just, he just thirsty. hungry or yeah. thirsty or curious. <laughs> he was just saying if they had some knee high or something in there. <laughs> oh, wow. I could sure go for an orange knee high right now. I sure hope one of them waves of orange knee high doesn't come through here and just sweep me away. Oh, oh no. The whole thing's falling. I could sure go for a Dr. Pepper. <laughs> I'm a pepper. You're a pepper. Oh, wow. Wouldn't you like to be a pepper too? I tell you, you'd really like one of these Dr. Peppers. My new girlfriend, Pepper. I'll get one for her. I wonder if she's a doctor. Oh, come on, Andy. She's no doctor. <laughs> Who are we kidding? <laughs> He closes his fridge door and this box that's on top of it full of uh, easily breakable jar smashes to the ground and a bunch of maybe their eyeballs. I think it's olives. This is part of the Oinko security is like, all right, we're going to get you a precariously positioned jar of olives. So if someone closes this refrigerator door with more, more than a feathers uh, force, this jar of olives will topple to the floor and the stench alone will wake you up, but the, the sound will probably get you too. I understand what you're proposing with the olive jars, but what prevents someone like me from accidentally setting off the olive jar alarm system? Uh I'm so glad you asked, because that's where our random box on top of the refrigerator comes in. Hmm, the box, you say. I like this. You guys at Oinko, you've really thought of everything. Well, we're thorough. So this old man, old Monty, outside hears the (laughs) olives crash. What in the hell's that sound? What's that stench? Pigs, get in there! (laughs) (laughs) What the hell are you doing in my house? And Jessica Beal runs inside, and old Monty follows him in, and is like, (laughs) you boys, you're so dead you don't even know it. And starts banging his cane on the ground saying bring it come on bring it is he's picking a fight with andy who's standing there holding a tire iron i think this old man wants to go knuckle to knuckle with owen wilson's doppelganger i actually think that he's talking to leatherface oh that's his trigger word right bring it it's the magic word for the day (laughs) and sure enough leatherface opens the door behind them revs up his chainsaw and now gives chase so jessica beale not waiting for anyone's invitation hauls out out of the house while Andy has to kind of scrap with Leatherface a little bit and uses his cross-shaped lug wrench to defend himself right but ends up getting up and away and there's yeah. this sort of chasing him from laundry there's lines. no way that leather face is gonna be able to catch him like running through all this laundry with a chainsaw he's a big fat man according to the research i did he is supposed to be like 400 pounds he, he chainsaws down the door to get out of the house and, and he also crashes through walls a lot in this movie like the kool-aid man oh for sure which is what jason Voorhees did in that friday the 13th remake like how do we get him in the room through the wall idiot what else would he do have you never seen a kool-aid commercial it's like i'm talking to an alien or something what about one of those randy savage slim jim commercials it's like that he did the same thing hell he used the same catchphrase oh yeah and he'd smash through a wall oh i've seen those they're quite good while andy is running away from leatherface and oh wow i gotta get away from this guy leatherface happens to swing his chainsaw at precisely the right time which takes andy's leg off at the knee yes and his reaction is much like he stumped his toe he just falls down and gives it a oh wow that's smart as opposed to (laughs) you cut off my leg (laughs) maybe that's what happened to monty like he chopped off those legs and threw him in the wheelchair but we will never know leatherface picks up andy and takes him back to plantation manor house of horrors jessica beale she runs through the woods to go somewhere just away Mm -hmm. back at the house of horrors we see leatherface carrying andy down to the basement where andy scratches his hand on the wall and losing a fingernail which ties back to the framing device of that black and white footage with the original sheriff's deputy again is r lee ermy the real sheriff in this movie and if so was he working with the guy at the beginning who knows is this the one and only time that we directly nod to that introduction i think so yes Mm mm-hmm yeah. Okay. Night falls and we're back at the van. It's Morgan and Pepper are on brain detail, cleaning up the inside <laughs> of this rolling crime scene. About to go TNT, yeah. motherfucker, all over everybody's ass. <laughs> Jessica Beale shows up and she pops in and uh, she puts the keys in the van. She's like, we got to get out of here. And Bo, wouldn't you know it, the van won't start. Who saw that coming? And so 
Sheriff Arlie Ermy shows back up again. Out of nowhere. Is there a problem here, maggots? Yeah, what's your major malfunction? What is this? A marijuana cigarette? Are you kids on the pot? I smell bullshit. Get out of that van. On your face. One, two, three, four. All three of you. We get a quick cutaway back to Leatherface, who puts Andy on one of those dangling meat hooks in their basement, and then packs salt on his stump and wraps that up in some butcher oh, paper. Oh, he that hurts. Oh, wow, that's smart. It wasn't the hook in Andy's back that caused him to howl in pain and discomfort, Bo. It was that salt in the open wound. I hate to interrupt you there with all your uh, cannibalism and whatnot, but uh, I have a little bit of a problem with heights. I was wondering if you could take me off the hook. Oh, wow, you're not. You're just going to murder me. Okay. Leatherface appears to put a makeshift tourniquet on Andy's stump. and But I'm like, based on the amount of blood that this guy would have lost, it's a little too little too late here. At the very very least andy is in shock and unconscious at this point like the human body is smart enough or the human brain i, I should say has a built-in function where if the pain gets too great you just go unconscious because your your brain will just be like oh this is too much we're switching off and i think having your leg cut off and then put on a hook placed on a meat hook i think that combo will trigger but what you're telling me is that slapping a little salt into an open wound brings us around the horn and suddenly the pain kicks back in okay that's right got it good to know our sheriff arlie army has the kids on their bellies and when jessica beale is like you've got to help us he just starts shooting into the dirt around her head like he's gonna ask her to dance to the film's credit this does let us know that the gun in his hand is loaded and is capable of firing bullets so then he has morgan get up he's like i need to know what happened in this van you the boy get in there and show me what happened and again before we can let this scene play out we cut back to leatherface who is now at a sewing machine preparing kemper's face and we also get a shot of him and we see that he's some kind of weird no-nose mutant dude he's at this old timey sewing machine his foot is on the pedal just gently tapping it making the needle rise and fall just the art of making your own clothes or heirloom quilts or horror skin masks all lost arts Bo. when he takes off the mask he has on he looks like skeletor his nose is gone and he's flat faced which none of that is in the original and it's unnecessary here there's a mention of it later when you get sort of uh an origin story of Leatherface. Which you don't need. Which you don't need, and it's something that Nispel wanted to bring out, that like, oh, Leatherface is actually the result of bullying. <laughs> it's like, uh, this is real stupid. So we cut back to Sheriff Harley Ermey, who has Morgan sitting in the back seat of the van, and he's like, so tell me what happened, maggot. I'm having a real trouble with the geometry of this. You don't seem to be lined up with that hole. And he's like, yeah, but the hole is in the middle and that's where all the blood and brains do you think that girl cares whether or not you're sitting in her blood and brains you get in the middle of that seat maggot (laughs) and so he does and he says all right here's the gun and he hands the the revolver they picked up off the girl gives that to morgan and he says show me how she did it and so the kid puts the gun under his chin not that way maggot that don't line up does it (laughs) it was in her mouth then put that gun in your mouth maggot three four drop and give me 20 (laughs) and so he does and meanwhile jessica beale outside is like shoot that guy (laughs) he turned the gun around and shoot him which he does he pulls the trigger but the gun doesn't have bullets in it arlie ermy at that point goes well Looks like we got us an attempted murder on our hands, Uh maggot. Get out of this car. New trouble is afoot, but not before we cut back to Andy, who comes to on his hook. Oh, hey, remember me? I'm Andy. I'm still alive. You know, although I lost half of a leg, but I got this amazing upper body strength. Look at this. I'm going to pick myself up on this bar and pull myself free from these hooks. Here we go. Oh, ah, I'm a little weaker than I thought I was. Just drops himself back onto I really thought I could pull myself off and hop away on my my good one leg arlie army has morgan in the back seat of his car and has apparently left jessica beale and pepper behind uh-huh. and morgan rightly is like this is so fucked up man this is and, bullshit. And sheriff arlie army is like so where were you all headed before me and my cannibal family abducted you is this is skinner concert <laughs> <laughs> what? Why, hell, I love Skinner. That's something we got in common. Everyone from Texas loves Skinner. <laughs> 
What are you going to do with them tickets now? <laughs> I'm not trying to sell them on Stop Hub or something like that and see if I can get some money. <laughs> I know Stop Hub isn't around right now, but neither are the songs that we talked about in this movie. <laughs> or maybe I just give them to you. What? Maggot, that is bribery. <laughs> what? No, no, I was just making a joke. <laughs> it's hard to tell when people are joking in this movie when they're being serious. <laughs> so Sheriff Arlie Irvy takes this liquor bottle that he's taken some plugs out uh-huh. of and smashes it across Morgan's face. Yeah. And then as Morgan is blown bleeding and spitting out teeth <laughs> arlie ermy takes out like a dental appliance in the front of his mouth and goes we got that in common too maggot i'm missing teeth does that tie back into the dental pieces that we found out in the field and the ones that we saw in the basement i don't think so i, I, I don't either who knows we here at oinko have another sister company it's called tooth fairy incorporated We make dental appliances out of the finest ingredients. And by ingredients, I mean things that we just find lying around at Oinko. Bone shards, pieces of hoof. That's why they're so inexpensive. We pass those savings on to you. At this point, Sheriff Arlie Ermey radios somebody. Is it Leatherface, who apparently is also a CB aficionado? I think it's the old woman. But I don't, I, I mean, I don't know. That's me just doing fan fiction. Or Monty, maybe? Maybe. Just show it! <laughs> Those two girls at the mill are good to go. Or he calls them fillies. Those two fillies are good to go. And meanwhile, the two fillies in question back at the van are trying to hotwire the van thanks to Jessica Beale's time in juvie. Right. And she's, she says, just call it a, a youth misspent. And so we see that, but then cut away from him immediately to go back to Sheriff Arlie Ermey. You know what it's like? It's like watching two TV shows at the same time with someone and you're not in control of the remote. You're just constantly yeah. bouncing from one thing to another and it's hard to keep track of what the hell's going on yeah, yeah. It, it's like when uh my girlfriend's adhd kid is trying to tell me a story and it jumps from one story to another until by the end of it i think that one of his classmates may have been spongebob square pants right. yeah and i'm like what is happening Use a pro down and it and so sheriff arlie ermy orders morgan out of the car get out of the car maggot he actually calls him a maggot in this scene i think it's like when you hang out with larry the cable guy whatever his real name is duncan wainwright or whatever and a getter done will slip out of his mouth it happens so effortlessly that you can't fault them i I think that he would use the word maggot so much that i'm surprised it wasn't in the movie more than we heard it i'm so proud that i don't know larry the cable guy's real name it's dan something and i I don't know the last name but sheriff arlie ermy is ordering morgan inside the house and says you people brought this on yourselves you should never pick that girl up and that's as close as we get to a hey like all this is happening to these kids because they were doing a good deed essentially speaking of this movie not explaining anything bo let's cut back to the van where they do get it started because hot wiring apparently is the easiest thing in the world to do movies have taught me that i think probably hot wiring is impossible they drive the van off and all of the wheels just fall off the van and i'm That's like right. did sheriff arlie army take off all the lug nuts who did this mm. and why and when and uh, who knows but while they're sitting in this now wheelless minivan, uh-huh. Leatherface just jams his chainsaw through the back window yep. and then climbs around on the roof. He's like a monkey. Yeah. And we see the chainsaw go through the Alfred E. Newman poster. Oh, dude. And then Pepper goes running. And then Jessica Beale watches while Leatherface catches up with her. And we know that she gets chainsawed because she's wearing this like puffy down jacket. And all of a sudden, a bunch of feathers go flying. See, I thought that was something from Clutco that he was using <laughs> right it's a, the clucko self-defense jacket right. where it will just shoot feathers at whoever might right. be it goes up in you. their face all of that down and they're like oh, and it distracts them oh, but, but i'm allergic to dander <laughs> <laughs> right. but in this case the clucko safety coat it did not perform as expected we'll take that to the right. boys at r&d and we'll get a second version of that in the works there's a reason that oinko is the sure. main right company and and Clucko is just a subsidiary you stick with your core competencies then you find opportunities to grow the business absolutely it, right. you know oinko was built on pig security and it will always be about one thing pig security the one thing we will always get right <laughs> is pig security chad i will say this is the best single moment of the movie <laughs> okay it, it it is when jessica beale has just witnessed pepper get murdered and leatherface who we have not seen directly 
uh, the camera aimed at his face uh-huh. until now looks back at her and she realizes that he is wearing Kemper's face. And we know that because it's all stretched out and has the pencil thin mustache. He looks like Joey Fatone. It is a moment that tells you everything you need to know in that moment, like her understanding that her boyfriend is now yes. dead and the horror of seeing that and but he goes right back to his old leather face right why does he take that off right and that's kind of one of the things with both the original movie and especially in chainsaw 2 the also directed by toby Uh is that Leatherface kind of adopts the personality traits to some extent of the face that he is wearing you think he was going to propose to her if he kept it on too much longer Uh, that would have been great if he (laughs) (laughs) dropped a one knee and she's like i can't say no to you kemper and then she just lives her whole life with leather face as her husband <laughs> jessica Biel runs off and ends up finding this trailer in the middle of nowhere what in the hell are we doing where there's this kind of jack spratt situation where we have this really scrawny lady and this really fat lady living there with some baby uh-huh. and as soon as she walks in the door she's like we got to get out of here there's somebody coming and they're like oh he's not gonna come in here honey have some tea uh, i need to use your telephone oh we don't have no phone here have some tea and as soon as the second have some tea comes out of their mouths you got to be like oh that tea is probably sure. drugged i need to get yeah. out of here we ain't got no telephone we ain't got no need for that and that fell out there with the chainsaw he don't mean us no never mind he's a good boy what won't do nobody no harm done living here him's just got a skin disease that's what's got him doing you and uh seeing his face drink some of this his and teasing this and this and <laughs> y'all and we see leatherface outside just kills his chainsaw uh-huh. as if to say like oh okay i'm good they got her well, i'm cool let's see where this is gonna go leatherface you know my therapist is always telling me not to look forward <laughs> to what's coming and not to live in the past but to enjoy the moment and in this moment i'm just gonna let life unfold i always come into these situations with a heavy hand leatherface light touch leatherface light touch remember your mantra the future is not promised the past is behind me that is why they call it a present just live it. look at those stars leatherface you've never just sat down and looked at the star hold on i gotta move this skin out of my eye Oh, now I can see him. Look at those stars. I'm so glad this guy had such a weird head. It really wraps around my face. You know, let me appreciate that for a moment. Let me appreciate... Thank you, Kemper, for having a big weird head. Thank you for that. You know what? That's sandalwood. Kemper, you... uh, I wish I could have gotten to know you better before I I cracked your head open and cut off your face and put it on mine. I think we, we might have been friends. We would have been friends. You know what? We are friends. I miss you, Kemper. Now that I'm wearing your face, I kind of am you in a way. And that feels good. I like being Kemper because Kemper, if you can hear me, you were a good guy. But so the women inside are just constantly like, have some tea, have some tea. And finally, Jessica Biel is like, fine, just give me the tea. And and immediately, as soon as she drinks some, slurp, slurp, slurp. Right, she starts getting woozy as she hears this baby cry. And the phone rings. And she's like, wait a minute, what is going on in this trailer? And realizes that the baby is the baby from the picture that they found in the jar of pee or whatever which is such a leap that you would remember that baby and see this baby and know it's the exact same baby it takes jessica beale drug saying but that's the baby for the picture <laughs> and also the phone is ringing and she's like but you told me you didn't have a phone. Why is everything going so funny? And then Jessica Biel falls over unconscious. And this is the point where we have the trailer moment of the fat lady going, oh my, oh my, 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 my. And we don't ever see that fat lady again. I guess she can't no. leave the trailer. It's like a Gilbert Grape type thing. I, I think that's right. <laughs> when she dies, they'll have to get a crane to lift her out of it. I think they just set the trailer on fire and call it a day. Probably. Let's just give her the old Darth Vader treatment. Why did she never mind i keep saying why but i just i don't care anymore it's probably for the best at at some point you've just got to release like leatherface just let go leatherface just let it go Uh, so sheriff arley (laughs) ermy appears over jessica beal pouring some beer in her face yeah he's just waterboarding her with a warm shiner bock and we're back at (laughs) plantation manor of murder and the sheriff's there old monty's there the woman from the gas station is there doing some light ironing and you're like oh i guess they all know each other Uh, okay in the first movie when 
when it's connected that the hitchhiker they picked up, the guy from the gas station and Leatherface, there's only three of them, that they're all in cahoots. You're like, oh, this is crazy how it's all coming together here. It's everybody that we've met in the movie is all in the house. And you're like, why are these people all? Okay, fine. It's a small community. They all know one another. The whole town is seven people and they're all crazy. (laughs) Right. I think the reason that that I'm confused around the sheriff is like everyone is sheriff a different day of the week. Who's got the keys to the (laughs) sheriff's car that you're sheriff that day if you end up with the keys in your pocket. (laughs) We see the Jedediah kid looking in from the outside again to remind us that he is a thing in this movie. Hold on. Hello, everyone. I'm here. No, that's it. Hello. Hey, Ewans. That's it. There you go. You've got the accent. (laughs) Top of my class at the Children's Acting Conservatory. Indeed. You know, next week I'm going to go on a Capri Sun commercial audition. It's in the bag, if you know what I mean. (laughs) This old woman from the store, this is the point where she starts talking about how everybody used to ridicule my boy. And that's why my little face, he was such a good boy and nobody ever gave him no credit for being a good boy. And instead they made him a killer. Yeah. And you're like, oh, what happened again? So you're Leatherface's mom? And then the, the kid from the acting conservatory outside the window, he goes, Grandmama! And you're like, wait, so hold on. Leatherface is your son. This kid says your grandma, which means this kid's dad is either Leatherface or the sheriff. Because in a minute, you're going to refer to the sheriff as being your son, too. I don't understand how all of these people are related. Yeah. And the movie is certainly not going to tell you any of it, uh, of this stuff. So Leatherface then is just given Jessica Beale to grab and throw into the basement, but then just locks her in there and leaves her so that we can have a chasing, I suppose. Because with Jessica Beale now in the basement and no longer drugged, she starts exploring around. We see a handful of body parts strewn about. And then she finds Andy hung up on his hook. And he's like, oh, wow. Oh, Jessica Beal, you made it. That's great. Hey, how about you get me off of this hook here? Oh, hey, hey, before you do that, did you notice that uh, Leatherface, he moved a piano per, like just below my one good leg, not the bad one that was cut off. Look, I've been practicing with my tootsies. You want to hear me play Heart and Souls? You want to hear? Hey, you, hey, let's make an agreement, okay? You and I will join together and play a little duet version of Heart and Souls. It'll be a, a life-changing experience. Okay, here we go. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Now you come in. Do, 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 do. Uh, hold on, I got it. Do, 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 do. The Jessica Beale, this is where you come in. Do, 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 I can't come in. Do, do, You're hanging do, on a hook. <laughs> this is the most horrible thing I've ever seen in my life. Oh, hey, look, I'm all but dead. I've lost every uh, drop of blood in my body except for the blood needed to have this conversation with you. All right, let's make an agreement, okay? You go over and find a sharp, pointy object, and then I want you to stick it in my belly and then kill me. Could you do that for me? Okay, I I got a knife, but wouldn't stabbing you in the belly just make the pain worse and it wouldn't kill you right away? No, 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 it's called the pain horn. It's something that uh, uh, Bo Ransdell explained a little bit earlier in the podcast. See, I feel a whole lot out of pain then it goes away then he puts the salt on my leg and now the pain came back but if you give me a like another boost of really intense deadly searing gut opening intral exposing pain i won't feel it at all so you won't have to feel any guilt for murdering me because you're doing this okay. with intent oh, oh, okay i'll just stab you right here about the place where your small intestine would be stab oh hey go <laughs> oh that hurt so much worse than i thought oh wow <laughs> we never got to play our duet he just immediately goes eh. yeah <laughs> It is dead. Why would they have her kill him? Just have her come down and find him dead. Also, credit where credit's due for this movie. It showed an unbelievable level of restraint of not having Jessica Biel's nipples more prominently featured in this movie. She's soaked in water multiple times. At the end, she's in a freezer. But at no point does this movie go below the bar of quality, respectable filmmaking to have her nipples be on full display. Yeah, I feel like that was probably in her contract i think so too she, well she got in that trouble remember she was in a magazine it wasn't playboy but it was like one of those fhm or those pg-13 men's magazines from this era i think that's what got her fired from seventh heaven which is crazy that she got fired for a pictorial display and the main guy on that show was a pedophile <laughs> 
allegedly. Really? The dad, the preacher dude on that, he got busted for being a creep. Oh, I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Go look that one uh-huh. up. Leatherface is watching all of this go down from above as he's just kind of charting. I, I guess this is where he gets off. Leatherface, just enjoy watching this. Eventually, you're going to kill her and wear her flesh. But for right now, just let her do her thing. Just let it happen. If you let the universe unfold in front of you, it will all come together. Quit forcing things, Leatherface. As she explores this basement, she ends up finding more in the tub mm-hmm. and thinks that he's dead but then he does a Whoa! can he not talk now because he got busted in the face with that bottle he talks fairly well for being smushed right in the puss while they're down there leatherface shows up to give chase but then jedediah our pint-sized savior he shows up and he's like hey yo follow me and they take off running through these tunnels that are very similar to the chase scenes in the friday the 13th remake and uh jessica beale and morgan they end up leaving and going to this abandoned is it like a cabin uh, i guess yes well they get inside and then they pull a couch over to block the door for safety but we've seen leatherface cut through doors and crash through walls already in this movie so that's not going to do anything and so jessica beale takes morgan and just stuffs him in this lonely wardrobe in the corner of this one room and she goes over and like hides over there in the corner it is the worst game of hide and seek you can imagine because there are literally only two places to hide in this room the wardrobe and over there in the corner which is where they are so leatherface is tracking them down they're hiding from this dude he's terrible at hide and seek also chad i'm just curious why he didn't just chainsaw jessica beale when he had the chance when she's running up the steps away from him before they even make it to this house he, he's not gonna grow repeating the same actions he's done in the past Bo. he knows that rather than criticize him for not cutting her up right there applaud him for being self-aware enough to know that he should wait see what happens maybe she'll right. fall into the chain saw on her own alleviating a little bit of the guilt that he feels each and every night when he lays down in bed to go to sleep with someone else's face strapped onto his skull. All right. So <laughs> Leatherface ends up grabbing Jessica Beale. He finds her pretty easy because again, they're because she's right is, there, Bo. Right you, it's, it's like, how do you find someone? It would be like if you walked into the living room and you were like, Hey, I found you sitting on the couch. No, you didn't. You just walked in and here I was like, she covered her own eyes right. like a child. <laughs> Morgan ends up trying to save her and, And in the process of of doing that, Leatherface actually drops the chainsaw, but he ends up somehow hooking Morgan on a light fixture, which, by the way... Morgan's still handcuffed, and that's what he hangs on the light fixture. Right, sturdiest light fixture of all time. It's the 70s. They had different standards of construction, not like the cheap stuff you see these days, Bo. That's fair. So while he's hanging up, Leatherface recovers his chainsaw and then kind of does a bottom-up slice. Dude, it's butt-cracked nutsack. Jessica V just takes off running because a lot of this movie is just people dying and her running through the woods getting away thanks to the fact that somebody else is dying in her place at the moment yeah Yeah, she gets to the road where one car ignores her something that happened in the friday the 13th Uh (laughs) remake and then she ends up finding her way to this slaughterhouse on the way though leatherface follows her and he gets caught up in some barbed wire and he drops his chainsaw which rolls over leaving a shredded wound in his thigh which that also happens in the first movie but it's much closer to the end this movie has an unnecessary finale tacked on to it but you got to keep in mind leatherface is not some supernatural being he's just a dude you get a chainsaw through the thigh dude you're done for the day you need to seek immediate medical attention or you will be dead this is one of the many things that this movie just screws up especially at the end of what happens you're like this is not even plausible what you're saying happened happened unless he is a supernatural being which as you said we've kind of ruled out uh, or at least there is not anything that would suggest that at this point other than this moment when he cuts himself is like eh, it's fine yeah. i'm gonna rub some dirt on it walk it off he's got a pocket full of salt i know how to treat this uh, salt and butcher paper and i'm good to yeah. go splash a little gasoline on it i'll be fine so he tracks her down to this slaughterhouse where she is hiding among the beef this slaughterhouse when she they approach it it appears to be operating in the middle of the night the lights are on there's smoke belching out of these stacks but there are no workers there there are live animals running around there's no locked doors they just walk right in is this a working slaughterhouse yes she goes into the freezer and there are just whole sides of beef hanging 
guess so, but why wouldn't somebody just lock a door? <laughs> or be there when it's running? I mean, it's not like this automated machine of onka chinka, onka chinka. All right, let me ask you a further question, Chad. When Leatherface comes into this place, why does he turn on the sprinklers? I can explain this. Because Please. the fine people at Oinko, they also <laughs> work know. very closely with a company called Cowcatchers, which owns this particular slaughterhouse. And with all of the security measures put in Horror Manor Plantation, the salesman explained to him that whenever you go into one of the Cowcatcher slaughterhouses, the first thing you have to do is turn on the sprinkler system so that the last girl remaining in your movie is sufficiently moist. It's pre-tenderizing or something. And again, not that I wanted to see see her nipples but i was like i'm shocked that sh th the fact that they doused her with water and then sent her into a freezer really feels like the recipe for nipples at the end of a movie but no nipples anyway uh, jessica beale does get a meat cleaver for self-defense good for and her in the one moment where she displays any kind of natural intelligence she hides in a locker and starts calling his name well she knows how terrible he is at, as being the seeker in a game of hide and seek like he barely found me when i was sitting in the corner if i get in a locker game over check and mate leatherface he tracks her down to this locker and he hears something coming out of the locker like some movement and he opens it up and surprise surprise jessica beale has turned oinko onto yeah. itself yes and has shoved a pig into this locker and he's like huh <laughs> and Jessica Beale then jumps out of the locker behind him and starts meat cleavering his arm off at the elbow. Yes. So he has a chainsaw gash on his thigh and he has now lost an arm. Again, credit where it's due. One of the few moments in the movie where I think this is actually pretty funny is him trying to get his arm as the arm still attached to the chainsaw spins around thanks to the motion of the blade. <laughs> And I'm just like, oh, I can't get it. I think that's pretty funny. I'm just going to have to wait till it runs out of gas, I guess. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> or the arm just falls off. Uh, one of the two. <laughs> While Leatherface is trying to get his arm back, Jessica Beale takes off running again and finally finds a truck driver willing to stop, mostly because she stands in front of it waving her arms. Right. And we get a repetition of some of the lines from the girl that they picked up at the beginning of the movie where he's asking her, like, honey, what happened and and she says i just want to go home i don't want to be here what if she pulled a gun out of her vagina and shot herself that would have been a surprise ending. right and it just continued to eat itself in that way like it just increasingly shorter films that always ended with a girl pulling a gun out of her vagina it's sort of that muppet show bit with the teeth of, i've never had a toothache this bad before uh sh shout out to the three people that saw that muppets show sketch <laughs> happens to be on the alice cooper episode one of the greatest uh while he's taking her to the store she's like trying to jerk the wheel and so forth because she's like you know i can't go back there and this guy gets out of the semi to go report hey i found a uh unhysterical girl in the middle of the road and sheriff arlie ermy and the old woman and the skinny lady with the baby are conveniently hanging out at this place in the middle of the night with the baby with the baby and so sheriff arley ermy is like you did huh let me go check your cab maggot and so he's going out to get jessica beale and he's climbing up onto the cab and we see jessica beale hot wiring uh, as well and you're like oh my god he's gonna find her before she can hot wire the car but it turns out that she is hot wiring not the semi but the sheriff's car right. apparently she's now the sheriff for the day. <laughs> right she found the keys in her pocket <laughs> and then ends up running down arlie ermy she doesn't just run him down though yeah she runs over him once then backs up and goes over him a second time and then goes over him again now one other thing that happens during all of this chaos is that during all of this before jessica beale goes to hot wire the car we left out an important detail she peeks in the window and she sees the baby and then while everybody runs out leaving this kid alone she goes and steals the baby so after she runs over sheriff arlie ermy three times committing the second murder in one day she now has this baby sitting in a car seat beside her in the front seat the way people used to drive around with babies in the 1970s now that she's got the sheriff's car she just drives off with the baby that we don't care about at all and there's a moment where as she's driving by a one-armed leather face he kind of swipes at the car with the chainsaw but 
it kind of doesn't matter because it's just in passing and she's fine it's just a i guess for the movie to say oh by the way leatherface is okay and still has his chainsaw because he is kind of the black knight from the monty python movie like, oh it's just a flesh wound dude have having my arm taken <laughs> off leatherface could have sprouted helicopter blades from his head and a navigation handlebar system from his shoulders and i would have found it to be as equally believable as him showing up at the end of this movie to whack her car one good time with his chainsaw after having lost his arm and gashed open his leg i mean he is just a terminator at this point right. which he's not because earlier yeah. we saw him sewing <laughs> right and the terminator clearly never sewed no, not at all he, in fact he just plucked eyeballs out of uh, of his face right. and whatnot so then the movie uh, isn't over 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 it cuts back to the yeah. framing device uh with that black and white footage following that law enforcement officer going down to the basement of the hewitt residence and the officer says come on now. we're gonna go down the basement here follow me here we go watch stepper and then like bigfoot leatherface just jumps out from the shadows and we hear grunting and we see this incomprehensible shaky footage of the film so i'm like did both these law enforcement officers the one filming and the one in front of the camera they got killed by leatherface in the basement who showed up with his one arm and his jacked up leg i don't know yeah and then there was footage of a police funeral right yeah well and it, like the john lyric narration picks back up where he's like oh by the way they didn't properly secure the crime scene before this jerk went down there with the cameraman and there were two people killed that day and this guy leatherface has never been found yeah the case still remains open today if you know anything about this call us unsolved mystery if you would like to see a texas chainsaw massacre remake sequel be sure to write the good people at platinum dunes yeah. and by the way go see this movie yeah and the movie stops on this blurry black and white image that could be anyone attending the gathering of the juggalos and this <laughs> and then and, and then john larroquette does, does he say something like this is the last known image of him or something like that yeah or, or the best known image yeah. or something like that and then yeah, this yeah. this quiet ominous music plays so that theater attendees can walk out and shame and question how they spent the last 90 minutes of their life. I wish they had ended it with a little heart and soul. Heart and soul, I fell in love with you, lost control, the way a fool would do gladly, because you held me tight and stole a kiss at night. Everyone. I thought you were talking about Huey Lewis in the news, Heart and no. Soul. No! Get Kevin Klein in there to sing Heart and Soul? Heart and Soul... <laughs> <laughs> sure they asked me if i would like to be in uh texas chainsaw massacre and i said uh no it's not a good movie i think that you know what if you were like 13 or 14 years old and hanging out with your friends and having one of those like oh this is crazy and you're just sort of looking for viscerally weird horror shit to watch this might check that box but as a well constructed movie because again the original is incredibly well done and for the time and budget and people involved it still holds Holds up as a very unsettling film this just feels like it is what it is let's remake this and make money and it's just not very good it's unpleasant like there aren't fun characters or anything the closest i think you come is that arlie army character who's a little bit of a a, a maniac in the right ways for a movie like this yeah. but that's sort of the island of things that are interesting about this movie yeah it's just it, it's not fun to watch the characters aren't in anything you can root for it's gory but not so much that it is like oh you've got to see this because of this outrageous gag in the movie or something the original in my opinion feels like a movie that when you're watching it you could almost imagine yourself in the character's positions because it happens so organically and it's so bonkers what goes down this almost seems plausible despite the ridiculousness of what happens this movie is so polished and everyone's so good looking and that it's made in a different time period it doesn't feel authentic or real and just doesn't doesn't connect it just feels like people just want to see leatherface running around chainsawing people up the whole movie is you are here to see people get murdered not not to do that that kind of empathetic thing of again that the original is so good at that you pointed out of you can completely see yourself in these positions where you're at the hands of a maniac family through no fault of your own yeah. you know like you just stumbled into this and are suddenly in the center of a nightmare whereas in this movie there are a number of times where you're like just go yeah just leave you have every opportunity to go and you are not tied to a chair during this nightmare dinner like in the original you can just run and leave yeah and it's just a slog like watching this movie twice in 
pretty short order and and doing the notes and so forth it's like the stuff that's supposed to be exciting like the chase through the laundry with andy and that kind of thing it's just kind of dull yeah and a lot of it feels like stuff you've seen in other movies before there's nothing really original or well except for all of the oinko yeah stuff. no uh, on the oinko stuff is maybe the reason to watch the movie yeah. just if you're looking for a home security system and want something that's a little off the beaten path sure yeah. It, like, if, do you live in a remote farmhouse where pigs can wander freely through it? And it's honestly, you're limited to Texas Chainsaw Massacre families mm-hmm. and that weird dude from the first season of True Detective. You got to start somewhere. And I would also say right. for anybody listening, you can go to our merch shop and we are selling horn sticks. We got an unlimited supply, quite honestly. I mean, supply is not a problem. <laughs> yeah. It's really demand. But if you come in and right now, if you use the coupon code, Oinko, one word, all capital letters except for the K, which is lowercase. If you buy 11 horn sticks, the 12th one is free and we waive shipping costs. Just go to pick6movies.com forward slash Oinko code forward slash merch forward slash horn stick, horn stick dash. Dash is important yep. on this one. Special offer. Percentage sign. Save. Yes. But the A is lowercase and S, S, V, and E are capitalized. Slash. Yeah. Forward slash index.php yes yeah well, yeah. we won't put a link to that anywhere so just you can find it it's easy it's on the internet search for that thing we said and and you'll be able to to order as many horn sticks as you want just hit the that like 15 seconds back thing on your <laughs> podcast app as many times as you need to, <laughs> to get it all all entered into the your url bar and god help you if you're using edge and it just does a search yeah, for and it. it doesn't work on mobile devices or safari browsers oh, oh, oh. or actually most no browsers you can get it on DuckDuckGo. <laughs> and you have to be using a vpn <laughs> oh yeah i thought that was a given but for <laughs> yes for sure you cannot you like because this is all out of malaysia so that's the remake of the texas chainsaw massacre now bo if we were to put together a mount rushmore of relatively contemporary horror movie icons we would certainly have jason Voorhees as your abraham mm-hmm. lincoln leatherface hewitt is going to be our thomas jefferson i think that your teddy roosevelt it would best be represented by frederick krueger or freddie as his friends call him and so for episode four of this season we will be discussing the man along with hugh jackman's wolverine who made a real fashion statement by having knuckle knives i think they're often <laughs> Uh, Wolverine and, and Freddy Krueger often mentioned in the same breath <laughs> as the heroes that maybe we don't <laughs> need, but the ones we deserve. Sure. So we're going to talk about the remake of that movie. And you talk about a movie that really uh, took the original in new and different and more unsettling ways. You really can't go wrong with the, the remake of uh, A Nightmare on Elm Street. It's uh, one of my least favorite movies I've ever seen. <laughs> Well, on that note, I'm going to stop because I'm so excited to discuss it with you. As always, <laughs> like, rate, review. Uh, tell your friends about the show if you like it. You can email us at fix6movies at gmail.com. You can find us on social media. But any final thoughts that you have on the remake of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Go get him, Leatherface. <clears throat> Pardon me? Go get him. I've got it. Go get him, Leatherface. Oink, oink. Oink.